Great. We are live on HowlRound. And uh, I'm good for you to ad admit the audience. Have a great show. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Blair Thomas, <clears throat> coming to you from the sunny but very cold Chicago uh, in the Chicago International Puppet Theater Festival in our final weekend. And here we are with the Ellen von Hockenberg Puppetry Symposium being co-hosted by the School of the Art Institute and the Puppet Festival and glad to be here in the virtual space with you all. Um, I want to just start by acknowledging that all the buildings that the Puppet Festival is taking place in, the, the almost dozen different venues that shows have been happening at are all sitting on the lands that had belonged to the Anishinaabe peoples around the Great Lakes area that included the Peoria, the the Potawatomi and the Sauk tribes. And uh, for centuries, uh, these people have stewarded this land. And for this, we express our gratitude. Uh, today, we have our, our first symposium on race and representation in puppetry. And this is being moderated by my colleague, Paulette Richards. And I have to say, it's a great honor for me to be able to uh, work with Paulette. She is an independent scholar and educator, puppeteer based um, up in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, she has uh, worked with the Puppet Festival at, in our online classes. She's been a leader in our catapult program, served on our recent strategic planning committee. Um, uh, and so uh, she and I have co-created this year's uh, four symposium panels. And um, her interest in puppetry covers puppetry in the Black Atlantic to animatronics and contemporary practices. Uh, she also co-curated with John Bell, the exhibit at UConn at the University of Connecticut. Uh, the exhibit was called Living Objects, African-American Puppetry at the Ballard Institute of Puppetry, um, Museum of Puppetry. Uh, she was also a Fulbright scholar in, to Senegal and has led workshops at the Friends School of Atlanta, Decatur Makers, the DeKalb County Public Library, the Center for Puppetry Arts, and the Puppeteers of American National Festival. Paulette is working on a book entitled Object Performance in the Black Atlantic. It's forthcoming on Rutledge Press in 2023. Um, so, uh, oh, I have to just quickly say uh, before I turn it over to Paulette that this event is being uh, captioned and recorded by HowlRound. And so some of you are seeing it on HowlRound and others through Zoom. There's two methods. If there's a chat available to you, you can please, you can post your questions in the chat. There'll be about an hour of presentations and then we'll have some half an hour of, of question answering from our panelists uh, here. And uh, so uh, other than that, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it over to Paulette. 
Okay, greetings. Thank you, Blair. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this third session of the Ellen Van Volkenberg Puppetry Symposium Series at the Chicago International Puppet Theater Festival. I'm Paulette Richards, um, and I'm serving as the moderator of this panel on race and representation in puppetry. Just a brief rundown on what took place in the series before. The first panel looked at how object performance allows us to interrogate the hierarchized distinctions that Enlightenment philosophers like René Descartes drew between animals, humans, and objects. The second panel considered Robin Frohart's The Plastic Bag Store as an opportunity to reflect on the impact the view that humans are separate from the natural world has wreaked on the planet. And those two sessions have been recorded and are available for your viewing pleasure on lives on the HowlRound. Our third panel today explores the use of object performance as a means of resisting the objectification of colonized bodies. Jamika Holloway, director of Dreaming, has found herself continually reflecting on Toni Morrison's quote, if there is a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it. Our panelists have taken that advice to heart by putting these unsung stories on stage. Specifically, these artists have staged stories of people who have historically been treated as objects. Thus, their work further connects with efforts that colonized and enslaved peoples have made to hold on to object performance traditions. And just a little brief summary of each show so you know the context that we're coming in from. Dreaming has been postponed, unfortunately, to the 2023 iteration of the festival, but it addresses the legacy of racism in comics and animation by interrogating um, the work of Windsor McKay, specifically characters that he created for Little Nemo in Slumberland. Uh, Ty Defoe's new work in progress, Skeleton Canoe, presents a rite of passage journey as young Nobin seeks to reclaim ancestral knowledge. And finally, The Bluest Eye is an adaptation of Toni Morrison's debut novel. The addition of puppets to Lydia Diamond's script is a novel way of inviting the audience to empathize with characters who struggle with their embodiment in objectified bodies. So we are honored that the creators of these fascinating shows have joined us this morning. I will introduce our guests in alphabetical order, then each will give a short presentation about their work. And after those presentations, as the moderator, I get to pose two or three questions to start the discussion, and then we will open the floor for questions. We're happy to take your questions at any point in the chat, whether you are in the Zoom room with us or on the HowlRound live stream, and um, our crew will feed those up and we will get them out into the floor. Um, in the open session. So first to introduce Tori Bend, who is a puppet artist and scenic designer. Her puppetry has been seen across the country and included in festivals such as La Mama Puppet Festival, the Great Small Works International Toy Theater Festival, and the Puppeteers of America Festival. Her work, The Paper Hat Game, is a New York Times critic's pick a Drama Desk Award nominee, and it received the Best Toy Theater Award from the Puppeteers America Festival, as well as an Unima USA citation. She has received grants from the Henson Foundation, the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation, Foundation for Contemporary Arts, and many other funders. Additionally, she is an associate professor at Duke University. Working with Tori Bend as the director of Dreamer is Jamika Holloway, an award-winning freelance director and producer based in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, Jamika was a 2018 Indie Arts winner, a 2019-20 grant recipient from both the Man Bites Dog Theater Fund and from the Ella Foundation Pratt Emerging Artist Program. In February, 2019, she was honored by the African-American Heritage Commission and Governor Roy Cooper for her contributions to the arts and culture landscape of North Carolina. She was recently named the 2021-2022 Roe Green Visiting Director in Residence at Kent State University. 
and her directing work has been presented um, on Northern Stage Shakespeare in Detroit, the National Black Theater Festival, Classic Stage, Dartmouth College, and the Duke Department of Theater Studies. After um, Jamika Holloway, we have Ty Defoe, who grew up in the Ojibwe and Oneida communities of his parents. He learned hoop dancing as a toddler and con continues to incorporate the hoop dance and the eagle dance in his performances. Ty describes himself as two-spirit, rooted in words, a shapeshifter of artistic expression, bringing stories to life. A member of the Dramatist Guild of America, Ty has written, produced, and performed in many theater productions, including Clouds Are Pillows for the Moon, In the Cards, and Heather Hansen's Flight, A Crane Story. His Grammy Award-winning album, Come to Me, Great Mystery, features healing songs by several Native American musicians. And to round out our lineup, we have Margaret Lorena Kemp, who recently earned promotion to full professor of theater and dance at UC Davis. Let's give her a shout out for that. That's extremely difficult. She is an actor, multidisciplinary performing artist and writer who completed her Bachelor of Science in Interdepartmental Studies from the School of Speech at Northwestern University here in the Chicago area. Kemp subsequently uh, trained at the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, DC, and earned certification as a master teacher in the Fitzmorris voice work system. She also joined the faculty of MICHA, that's the Michael Chekhov Association. In addition to her work as an educator, she maintains an active performing career on stages such as Arena, Arena Stage, Yale Rep and the Magnet Theater in Cape Town, South Africa, where she met Jani Young, um, who is her collaborator for this production of The Bluest Eye. Her screen credits include roles in Children of God, Bloodbound, The Orlando Jones Show, and Commander in Chief. So um, then we will now move into the panelist presentation, starting with Tori Bend and Jamika Holloway. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Paulette. Um, thank you, Paulette. I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I'm just going to make sure I can actually pull up my notes here. Okay, there we go. Um, it's a real honor to be here uh, in this virtual room with everyone today. And thank you, Paulette and Blair for making this possible um, for uh, gathering all of us. As Paulette mentioned, Jimmy and I um, were not able to actually perform our production um, with you all in person uh, this year. We look forward to doing that in the future, um, but so, so grateful to be with you all uh, right here and right now. Um, so instead, we are going to be sharing some images with you today, tell you a little bit about our production and the process that we've gone through. Um, I'm going to make a small note of correction, Paulette. I am actually the director and Jamika is the associate director, although um, that is a rich point of conversation in itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, we certainly work um, as partners in this process. Uh, I just wanted to add, thank you so much for having us. I'm so happy to be here. Um, always in conversation with Tori around this work. It seems like over the last uh, two or three years, it's sort of become this sort of ritual with us. We're always gathering in the name of the work. Um, and also I wanna say that Tori and I, even though we are in different locations, um, are um, in Durham, both in Durham, North Carolina, uh, on the um, traditional lands of the Okamichi, Stephanie, um, and Eno tribes. And we would just love to share, share out our gratitude um, for their contributions, their original contributions to arts and culture um, and cultivation. Um, on these lines. So to start, we'll just give you, we'll have images and we're gonna give you a little um, sense of what the show is, talk through the plot, um, a little bit about the puppet puppets, and then we're gonna get into uh, more of the process in making this work. And one of the things that Jamika and I have found as sort of a priority um, in, in this show in particular, but we think it's, uh, probably applicable to um, really making work 
um, that tells BIPOC stories in general. And so we think it might be an interesting uh, a point of conversation um, today. Sure, yeah, um, one of the things that has continued to come up for us um, throughout every iteration of this piece is all of the ways that we can um, center care for the artists who are um, a part of this process. And some of the, some of the ways that we implement care we've had to learn to do so the hard way, right? Like through, um, through sort of watching artists reach and meet bandwidth and capacity um, with the overall, um, with, with all of the elements that go into this work, the mathematics of puppetry, the physical obligations, and then also, um, uh, you know, when it comes down to mental, mental health and because so much of this, especially I think for um, people of color, um, it, this work becomes very low, much more loaded. Um, and so I just will just start a little bit, uh, talking a little bit, to give you a little synopsis of the play. Um, so Dreaming follows two men deeply affected by Wendell McKay's comic strip, Little Nemo in Slumberland, which was published from 1905 to 1914. The play takes place in 1934 after McKay's death in a world in a world where comic book characters live side by side with real people. Malachi Washington, and, uh, an artist and visionary, works for free comics. He works to free comics stuck in racist and prejudiced bodies. You can go to the next slide, please. And then we have Bob McKay, Windsor McKay's son, who seeks to revive his father's old comic strip. To do so, he must first find and then convince the old characters from the, script, the strip to join him in the remake. The two men confront each other and learn that Malachi was once trapped as the character Empty in Winter McKay's racist depiction of an African boy who speaks only gibberish. At the end of the play, Malachi reveals his work. Freeing comics is a part of a larger vision to free not just bodies, but minds from the, the limits of white imagination. And we can go to the next slide. So we want to um, go. So we want to make sure that um, we also talk about the puppets a little bit. Uh, there's. There's three types of puppets that we use in this show. We've got our um, tabletop, toy theater, and overhead. Uh, in this image, you can see our tabletop um, character of Malachi. Uh, and those puppets are our lead characters, uh, and they're also real people. So they are walking around in 30s New York, um, side by side with toy theater puppets, uh, which are flat, obviously, in toy theater. Um, and they're the comics stuck in the two-dimensional form. So sort of cast as these comic characters in comic strips, cartoons at the time. Um, and those are in our two-dimensional form and in color. We also utilize toy theater to create the historic environment of New York in the 30s. Um, the buildings, also crowds of people in Harlem, in Hell's Kitchen. So we get to see uh, the movement and depth of the city through these black and white photographs of 1930s New York in opposition to these comic images uh, that are created by, um, that are original drawings that we have in the public domain that we've used uh, of replicas of images from comics and cartoons of the time. And then our third type of puppetry is overhead. And we use the overhead projectors, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, tell stories of the flashbacks, memories, dream sequences, and Windsor McKay's cartoon work. Um, we, in other moments, we'll use it to layer and to add texture to the toy theater, um, to the toy theater world. Uh, but there's, it also allows us to play with this idea of embodiment, dimension, um, real life character and the flattening of uh, racist and stereotypes bodies that are happening in these in these um, cartoons. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Right. So, uh, Tor, should we start talking a little bit about the the way that I was incorporated into the process and see where they yeah. yeah yeah that would be great yeah. 
Okay, great. So, so I'll say that I came onto I came onto the project a couple of years in. I want to say, Tori, you had uh, already done a couple of workshops of the piece. It had already sort of seen a couple of new lobs, right, new versions. And um, at some point, Tori got into collaboration with Howard Crafts, um, a, a Durham-based playwright, and Howard really crafted out this one of one of his specialties in writing is crafting out these beautiful black superheroes. And so I love the world that Howard has really created for us here, um, that where the rules are sort of set up to uh, really be conducive for the world of puppetry um, and um, really embracing that sort of like the scale of the you know comic book um, nature. And so anyways, I came onto the, this project, um, no, because we, I think Tori was understanding that it needed a little cultural context around some of the ideas that were really shaping um, and, and, and forming around the work. And I think one of the things, a couple of, of the things that we, we just sort of laid out on the table immediately is, is that with Tori asked the facilitator of this particular story, um, it, it, it also needed to be assisted with folks who could do a little cultural authentication around um, the, the shaping of the world. And I think that that's probably around the first time that, that we understood that the sort of care that this play needed. And then it started to grow as we were thinking about who the performers um, of the work is. And as you can see with some of the images here, um, how difficult some of the embodiment may be for, um, and, and we haven't even gotten to, I think, the more explosive ones. Um, but in the world that we're creating, 1930s, the, the world that we're exploring is in, 1930s, there's a lot of loaded material that needs to be handled with a lot of responsibility, a lot of um, informed choices. Um, and so I feel like, am I, on the, am I taking this the right doing direction? A great job. <laughs> no, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great okay, job. Okay, okay. Okay. I think um. <laughs> it's useful. It's so useful to hear your perspective because I think um, it is, it's meaningful that Jamika came in later in the process um, and, and because she was needed. And um, in retrospect, and as, as we've been learning, as I've been learning through this process, um, you know, you, it's easy to say, well, I should have done this sooner, but it is important to do it as soon as you realize it, yeah, <laughs> even absolutely. if you were wrong to not realize it earlier. And so, yeah, Jamika came in really at this point where it was clear that cultural contact was, was essential and that I was not able um, to provide that alone. Um, and I can go more into that history, but I wanted to make sure that Jamika, you had kind of finished what it felt like to, to step in um, and, to be, and to become a part of this project. Yeah, and, and because I don't come from a background of puppetry, my work has really been centered on uh, live performers, live, you know, live theater on stage. This learning the mathematics of puppetry, uh, the, you know, really the logistics of all that goes into it was also um, just so illuminating in the time, in, in that time, especially coming on in the role that I did, because what I was learning and really gleaning is not only are these, um, you know, these puppeteers operating these objects and these, uh, you know, the, these puppets, they, I think there was such symbolism in the fact that they're also building the world of this story as they are sort of setting up, you know, scene to scene. And so like how, so, re, so, so for me, it's like, you know, rebuilding the world of their traumas and um, so to, so I think, you know, that impulse for us to really sit deeply with the ways in which this story was told, like what the makeup of this casting needed to, to look like for the thriving of it. Um, and then like, what are the sort of conversations that, uh, that, we, that we need to be having around it? And I think we were, so, we were really blessed with a very, um, you know, curious, cast and a cast that was really, uh, that really leaned into dissecting some of these moments, these, some of these moments of imagery and even some of the sounds. I remember we had this laugh at one time that we cut no longer there. And so there were also these like sonic elements of the play that really had to be reshaped when we made the decision that this play was gonna be about community and care. And we haven't always done a great job of like staying on mark with that, right? Like that should be said. 
But I think, you know, again, like very early on in the process, just thinking about all of the elements and how they came together. Um, we, we, we knew that like the, we, we had a responsibility to, to these artists to, to move in a way that was unique to puppetry. And, and as Jamika says it, you know, we, I certainly came to this, but we came to this um, through process uh, the, you know, the, this work was created and started because I had come across McKay's drawings um, in a, in a um, book and just found his scale change and his perspective shift and his dramatical theater, theatrical visuals absolutely compelling and as a puppet maker and also with a scenic background it just felt like it was begging um, for for some sort of puppetry um, adaptation uh, probably next slide I think I've gotten off of my slides here um, but I so I took I took these original drawings way back when this is like six years ago now um, and and went on um, a, an artist retreat to really make this adaptation. And what I quickly realized is that I had a really big decision to make. And that was, was I going to make a piece of work that ignored some of the main characters in Windsor's work? Um, or was I gonna actually tell a story and comment on Windsor McKay? And, and that question, you can look at previous adaptations of Little Nemo and Slumberland and most people ignore Impy. Most people just drop Impy from um, it's been done as a theatrical play, a musical. It's been done as um, a cartoon. Uh, and most people drop it, drop the character altogether. Some people, in one case, I think someone had turned Impy into a sort of pet-like rabbit mm -hmm. for, for um, uh, Nemo to run around with. Uh, and so really that question was so important. And what I realized is that I wanted to make sure that we were interrogating Windsor. Um, I wanted to make sure we were looking at how these comics impacted cartoons and animation today. And to do that, we had to show both the brilliance and the flaws of Windsor McKay. Um, we are running short on time. I can't believe that. I we, know that was one. So I'm gonna just jump, Jamika, is it okay if I kind of jump to my last question? Um, I, think, I think one of the things that we've come to um, in this sense of care that Jamika talked about and how essential that is, is that um, we need to be prioritizing the care while making difficult work, but um, it's, and it, but it's greater than just prioritizing care for puppeteers um, or, or people of color. It's really understanding that, um, that puppeteers often in puppetry take second fiddle to the object itself. And that could create a place where we are not seeing and not attending um, to the puppeteers that are enacting um, and, and bringing these things to life. We as puppet makers spend a lot of time on all that detail on all that scenery, those puppets, we don't wanna cut them. Um, and yet, particularly when dealing with material that is sensitive and dealing with performers of color and wanting to center um, people of color and the stories of BIPOC folks, um, we need to make sure that we're tending and creating space and mm -hmm. making sure that this process of telling difficult stories isn't re-traumatizing anyone and can be actually a healing process. Um, so I guess my question with that is how possible is that? Um, certainly in our process, that has been the thing that has come to the front as we've learned how to be better at making this work. Um, and it's something that as we go forward, want to continue to make sure that we're getting better and better at. Okay, thank you so much, Tori and Jamika. Mm -hmm. And that is an excellent question that you have put on the table. So next we will turn to Ty Defoe. Are you there, Ty? Are you ready? Bonjour, everyone. I am so ready. Wow, what a thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge on, on that piece. And I cannot wait to experience it. So miigwech. So do everyone or boo to the zoo. Ty Defoe and Dijna Kaz was swagging in Dunjaba Magizin Nindo Dem. I said, hello, good morning, feeling the weekend vibes, ready to talk about race and representation because it's in the morning, it's at noon, it's in the afternoon, it's in the evening. Um, and I'm, you know, talking about racism, representation, and also um, decolonization and how that relates specifically to Native Indigenous peoples and puppetry. And um, I just also want to underscore, um, too, that I'm just speaking from one 
experience, which is my own, um, and also providing hopefully some teachings from uh, mentors and elders and other puppet makers who have been invisibilized and, you know, uh, erased by colonialism. So um, is seen in a different view. Um, but I'll go to the next slide. So hello and good morning. And also, I will say too, I'm very excited because I'm on the land. Land of the Council of Three Fires. So here is a photo I've embarrassed here um, of my And um, at the age of seven, that began, started working with object in the objects called hoops. Um, and these hoops, it's a special dance. And first sort of in these um, hoops, out, maybe 24 inches in diameter. And you begin to make different animal formations. You get to make different relatives, as I refer to the two-legged, four-legged, winged, and rooted. And so, um, so I just wanted to share this with you all once when I had bangs. Um, but this dance is very highly, you know, it talks about how we are all intra and interconnected, which is very important as it relates to Indigenous Native philosophy, in particular, the Anishinaabe people. So I'll go to the next slide. And um, yeah, so here are some of my greatest teachers, um, my mother and my father. And I wanted to show you them both because they are both movers, um, movement workers, uh, dancers, enacting different uh, stories as it relates to um, being uh, showcased at, uh, I guess, community events, ceremony events and also public powwows. And um, my mom on the left here wearing this like beautiful, um, elaborate medallion of an eagle at which um, my father is, that is his um, clan representation in terms of uh, sacred ceremonies, how to be, who you're related to and everything. And my father on the right, of course, who is sort of, um, looking at what seems like at the ground is holding a shield and dancing with a shield and feathers and a fan. And I wanted to show these two photos because at an early age for me, um, I began to learn about story. I began to learn the importance about culture and it really started to shape not only language, but also worldview. So when I think about, um, you know, object, for example, I think um, when I think about object as an Anishinaabe person, I think about subject Object and I think about relative, right? So not necessarily, um, you know, things described as as nouns, but you know, when we when something has a word in the language, it becomes real. It it actually becomes relative. So what are the ways that we are making, um, you know, reciprocal relations um, with so-called objects, um, stories? They actually become a living, breathing entity. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, here is um, my grandmother. I kind of pulled out my grandmother went to a boarding school, right? So folks don't know about boarding schools, and I hope that you do. This is very important as it relates to Native Indigenous history, um, because these boarding schools at a time, you know, language was taken away, hair was cut, stories were taken away. This um, began this great white settler colonial project, right, of completely invisibilizing and erasing Native indigenous people from their homelands, from their stories. And since we're talking about puppetry today, puppets, right? Um, and all of all of the things that make you who you are. So I wanted to show you the sort of cookie cutter, um, like personified image of what, um, you know, everything should look like. It should look like the same thing. And it goes without saying this is, um, you know, I am a survivor of this handed down past historic trauma. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and because of that, 
you know, because of because of that handed down historic trauma, it was always embedded in me to really centralize community at an early age. I'm at an elder care center here. You see someone with a walker and other folks um, gathering in different places to tell stories. I began to go and I was actually very shy and did not want to speak. So it was really easy for me to move through space and um, sort of operate and work with um, objects to tell stories. And because of that, um, I did at every opportunity along with different teachers um, to tell stories. Some of those teachers are you know, Kevin Locke and Dallas Chief Eagle and the, the passing of Joanne Shenandoah uh, incorporating songs. And I'll go to the next line. And so, you know, I show up to the Chicago International Puppet Festival, right? I'm on this neighborhood tour, going to many different neighborhoods. And, um, you know, I'm talking about symbolic literacy, right? Knowing worldview and that at an early age. So I so show up in Chicago and I see images like this posted all over. You know, I think this was taken uh, in last week um, over at Navy Pier inside. And you see there's um, a Black Hawk. If, if folks don't have not seen this image before outside of a United States context, um, it is a, a hockey team that's, you know, and there's things that are going around about um, mascots and, you know, white settler colonialism, really sort of pushing a false and narrative forward and perpetuating myths about what native indigenous people need to look like, be like, feel like, talk like, eat like. I mean, it goes down to a very cellular level. And of course, um, that goes um, definitely with puppetry. So I'm going to talk a little bit about symbolic literacy. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so this I wanted to show you, this is um, actually um, comes from the Americas and it's an exhibit from the Museum of the American Indian. Um, and of course, you know, native imagery has been used by the federal government to distinguish the United United States, in particular Turtle Island from other nations, to divine nation for citizens. And, you know, images like this were used by U.S. Armed Forces to express um, the militarization, right, to define uh, the uh, American corporations and to signify to people and to designers um, to add a sort of a luster or a cachet to commercial products, right, which sort of plays into uh, capitalism. And we know capitalism is a cousin of um, white settler colonialism. So images like this that are shown throughout history, you, these some of these images still exist. Some of them have been because of community organizers and folks really looking at the invisibilization of Native people have, um, you know, the Land O'Lakes butter, of course, um, Indigenous female has just been, you know, removed from the butter. So there are things that are happening, but there is so much more to do. Um, there's something, you know, a question in this exhibit that is asked is how is it that Natives can be so present and then also so absent in, in quote, American life, right? When you think about it, um, Native peoples are less than 1% of the population, but where you ever you go in the United States, you see these kinds of images in grocery stores, at gas stations still. Um, and it's something that also becomes numb if you're not really looking for um, these kinds of symbols. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, every time I look at this, I'm just like, wow, it's just almost uh, unimaginable when I think about ancestors and what folks had to, you know, sort of go through. So we could be here today in 2022 and I could speak here in the Zoom. So these, um, some of these images might be familiar to people, right? So there is something coursing through, um, of course, the enclave of the puppetry world, um, as well as a greater political. Puppets. There's hand puppets, there's finger puppets, of course, um, there's in quote objects, right, that people are, are moving around. Um, but these uh, images are made by uh, non-Indigenous individuals. They are produced by non-Indigenous individuals. Um, they are directed by non-Indigenous identities. 
objectified individuals, you know, um, and the image on the left here is, um, you know, is very, it's, um, you know, a marionette puppet mechanically works like a marionette puppet. But if you look very closely at something that's personified like this, the symbolism is so um, far reaching to be native or indigenous or to exemplify what a native indigenous person might look like based on an era of romantification of exotifying uh, indigenous men in you know warriorship roles and leadership roles um you know and of course the, the perpetuated myth of the thanksgiving tale where um you know so much is not said about the genocide of native people in turtle island um and of course Sesame Street, right? Um, Sesame Street, people grew up with Sesame Street. And I had to include this images because it, it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, how could you know what you don't know, right? So it's on uh, allies and accomplices to do the work to really understand politically what's going on with Native people, to engage with community. Um, and to really ask the questions about how to amplify voices if you are very interested in that. So, um, you know, people are doing as much work as they can. And this is just, you know, images throughout decades of time of, of what is happening in puppetry. So we're, we'll breeze through these next slides. So we'll go through the next slide, please. Yes. And so Native Indigenous puppetry has been on Turtle Island for decades. We're going to get into some images that were given to me from teachers and collaborators I'm working with now. Next slide. Um, this is uh, exclusively used in society rituals. Uh, it's not an actual um, like carving of, of, of a doll or a puppet that's used in a day we went side society, but it's something that's publicly can be seen figures like this. It's uh, um, from a survival exhibit and um, so an image like this, um, the object is hollowed out and it's in there are sacred things placed in its uh, chest and sometimes its backside for healing purposes, right? So sometimes um, puppetry in my worldview it was used for sacred, sacred acts for, for healing. So I'll go to the next image. Uh, and some of the biggest influences uh, to me, or here is someone um, from the Clinkett um, community is Jean Tagaban, right? Someone who I saw as a youth who was there placing on, um, you know, raven feathers to tell stories and enacting stories with a wooden head. Uh, this to me was puppetry. And it's something that was like highly influential to me. Next slide, please. Uh, buddy big mountain a marionette performer in florida that um you know if you weren't looking you probably just pass by and say oh this is a marionette performer but was a, a really influential we'll pet we'll go to the next slide here's another picture and next slide i just wanted you all to see these really amazing images uh, corn husk dolls from the Horidoshoni Nation, right? Dolls that were given to teach about vanity to uh, young women. Next slide. And puppets now that are talking about language revitalization, puppets used in communities, the Dene Nation, as well as Canada. Next slide. And the Cree Nation right? I think Native people are so funny and are using puppets to really Next slide. So uh, here's a, an image, right, by a, um, I guess, cross-racial team. And I always think about, I, I think about how are people collaborating and what kinds of questions, ethical questions that you need to ask each other before you start collaborating. So this is um, one um, production I've been following called The Breathing Hole. And I'll, um, you can go to the next slide and I'll just keep talking. Thanks, Josh. Um, you know, it's like, it is. What does it mean to think about stories and puppets as a tool for resistance to fight against colonial inequity and erasure, right? I think these are things that if you're collaborating with someone, you like need to talk about right up front because, you know, it's the difference about being in quote good or being real. Like which one do you, which one would you like to, to do? So next slide. 
And Josh, you can just breeze through these next slides and I'll just talk so people can kind of see as I'm chatting. Thank you. So some birch bark I'm working with, really interested in materials. materials. I think, um, you know, here at the Chicago Puppet International Festival, I'm working with um, materials and really fascinated by that. I think it's really important. And I'm just showing some images from productions I'm working on. Of course, a G-Jack on Turtle Island uh, made with several collaborators, Kevin Tarrant, Don Avery, and Heather Henson. Um, and, you know, a lot of this work, I think, because it isn't, um, you know, out there so much, it's really galvanizing people to engage in dialogues about that. Some of these puppets, of course, were made by the Jim Henson workshop, which I was so grateful to work with different artists and, and bring alive stories and bring those uh, to people. So people can think, especially Indigenous youth um, and people in our communities, that our stories are animate. They're, they're animate things to be heard and spoken of. Of course, if you were on the neighborhood tour, I utilized materials such as wings that were given to me at a young age. And I kept using those, of course, to study um, the movement of, of objects and puppetry. And we'll get into some of these next slides with the, um, the skeleton canoe. And Josh, you can just keep tapping that return button so folks can see that. Maybe you all, you all have questions to ask me so I don't have to talk so fast about each slide. That is at Tiny Tempest Farm uh, with Blair. So Skeleton Canoe, I'm working with a few different collaborators, uh, Kate Freer, Blair Thomas, and Mark Denning. We um, began conversations and talking about this piece and Blair approached me and really wanting to do a 360 holistic view of an indigenous piece. And I you know, really thought about what that would be, what it would look like, what conversations would happen, um, You know, going to ask permissions from elders in the community about you using specific materials, um, how to get bark from trees. Um, the piece is called Skeleton Canoe and we're doing an in-work progress showing this weekend. There's Blair, of course, my ally friend there taking a bow, right? So it is really, you get really intimate in some of these conversations with folks. Um, you know, Blair and I, I told Blair, I was like, you know, if you're not dreaming seven generations ahead, you are not dreaming big enough, right? And that's a philosophy when we first started chatting that becomes extremely, extremely, extremely important. We started talking about truth telling, liberation, nourishment, healing, uh, re-remembering, and of course, always to deepen democracy. So I end here with saying, what does it look like to challenge present colonial leg legacies and imagine a decolonial futures? Thank you so much, everyone. Much more to say, reach out if you need. Okay, thank you very much, Ty. As always, that was very educational and fascinating. And so we will bring in our uh, third final panelist, Margaret Kemp. Margaret, you're muted. <laughs> well, I'm muted now. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I just wanna thank um, the festival and um, my, these wonderful, what hopefully one day collaborators that have been talking about their work, um, just really, really in inspiring. And I would um, sort of like to uh, tell you the form of this. I'll, I'm gonna talk and then we'll see a, a clip of um, the bluest eye that um, you'll hear all about my collaborators in the process in, of creating this work. But I do wanna start, um, if you don't mind, Ty, with my uh, paraphrasing you if you are not dreaming seven um, generations ahead, you're not dreaming big enough. And I think that that was really the impulse for um, my um, imagining the bluest eye as a work for object performance, as particularly puppetry. I'm very, a lot of, I, I do, I'm two things. I'm a, an artist and I, I'm an academic. I have students that I am, uh, feel a sense of responsibility for. Um, in their, um, what does it say here? I think I'll just have some classes to see. Um, boost my sound a little bit. Okay, got you. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Did you hear the quote? I, I paraphrased Ty. You heard that part. Okay, great. 
<laughs> so um, I, I just want to say there are two parts of my brain and two parts of the process that we're in creating this work. One is that I, um, I teach, I have students and I'm responsible. I, I have a great deal of responsibility towards them. And I am also an artist and I have great curiosity and um, a, a longing to create work. And um, the, uh, also important to know that I teach at a majority white institution and, um, and I come from that kind of training. So these are things that are important. And throughout my training, there's always been very little for me to do in the classroom besides do scene work in class and maybe small roles on occasion um, if somebody was feeling especially nice to me. Um, and I think that that is, um, we, uh, Jam Jamila talked about care. Um, that is not the way to care for our students of color. I think it is, um, I felt it's a strong responsibility that I take to give my students an opportunity to explore work that is um, culturally specific for them and challenging for them. So this is where this work arises from. Um, I, and, oh, I hope you also heard that I'll show a clip of the work after I talk about it. Um, and I'm going to talk about all the way through the process because we didn't, this didn't, we didn't put on a play. We started reading plays and asking questions. Um, and, uh, and The Bluest Eye was just one of many plays that, that we read, but this was a play that many people responded to. Lots of people had questions and lots of different types of people had questions. And I started to really think about how would a community with just, you know, at the most three African-American students, if they wanted to be in it, um, would be in it. How could we do that and with a show that required 13 actors? What is a way to do that? And as a lot of theater departments are very siloed, um, you know, if you're supposed to teach acting, you just teach acting and you stay quiet. If you're supposed to teach dance, you just teach the dance and stay quiet. If you're supposed to do the scenic art, you just do make the set and, and stay quiet. But as an African-American creator, I've never had that luxury. And I don't know many African-American creators that do have that luxury to silo themselves. So I was very easily and very quickly able to think broadly about how this story could come to um, the stage. The students started with study rather than starting with, oh, we're gonna put on a play. It started with reading The Bluest Eye. Everybody had a copy of the, the, the novel, The Bluest Eye. Everyone read the original text that Toni Morris, um, excuse me, that Lydia Diamond adapted before we moved into thinking about it through visual storytelling. And this is a way of thinking about honoring our elders, our, 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 our lineage as Ty and Jamila also talked about bringing the lineage into the classroom. And I think this is important because a lot of people are saying we need to, to change um, the, 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 the canon. But what I actually think is we need to get under the canon and into the roots of the practice and start the change in that place. And in doing that, that's saying, I'm gonna bring in the lineage. I'm going to say this idea comes from James Baldwin. These, these movements that we're doing, I'm thinking about in Suzaki Shenge, continuing to bring in the theatrical leg legacies and the literary leg legacies that are as much part of this process as creating the work. So going beyond just putting a play on stage. Our rehearsal process included um, some ways of approaching work and taking care, as Jamila again said, um, that were developed by artists such as Ping Chong and Company. This idea of, of having a constellation, a place where students can have a, a, a language-based conversation about the challenges of doing the work all the time, this idea of having a simmering pot in the room, things that are, are troubling them. So they're actually writing about the process while they're in the process. And also 
when we created the original work, we had weeks and weeks and actually years and years where we could have conversations, long ones and small ones about race, about representation, about the fact that there were very few African-Americans in the room and students asking, do we have a right to be in this voice? Um, and from that, I'd like to actually spend a little time talking about voice, which was the first thing that I, I knew in the performance was going to be challenging. People came to the audition for this work um, with a performance of blackness, which was really troubling to me. <laughs> Um, and um, most people uh, coming to voice the characters with what I call kind of a sonic blackface um, and being able to just stop the students and ask them to just just say the words in your voice. Allow us to, wh what moves you? Why do you want to do this? And just be in, in your voice and let the power of the language make room for others to enter who may not be Black people, allow them to enter so that they're not um, sort of stopped by sort of a shield of behaviors that are not you. So the puppets allowed us to do that, um, to say, this is who we are. And we are used, uh, engaging with these puppets. And I say, as talismans, that allow us to help each other to tell this story. Um, while we engage with puppets, I feel that there is also a lot of object performance um, as part of this work. It was our way, Jenny Young, who is the designer of the puppets and my co-director in this process, um, because I was reading the book and puppets were using these tables, I started to started to think about how could these tables be in conversation with the precarity of being black in an urban society where safety is not guaranteed. So training the puppeteers and saying, this sidewalk is a place of safety and then it becomes a place of non-safety. How can we engage with actually the scenery and the, um, the props as part of our storytelling as puppeteers and as human beings. Um, the original production had lots of doors all over, yet um, Pakola Breedlove lives in, in the storefront. She, she doesn't have privacy. And reminding the students that that is one of the challenges of being um, Black in America, that lack of privacy, that lack of safety. Anybody can come in at any time and um, challenge your life or, or take your life. So these are very real conversations that um, we had. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what was a prologue in the piece and is a prologue in the piece. And um, I'm going to quote Toni Morrison and Lydia Diamond's script regarding the, the world with, that we live in. I talk about how it was the fault of the earth, the land, our town. I even think now of the land of the entire country was hostile to marigolds that year. This soil is bad for certain kinds of flowers certain seeds it will not nurture, certain fruit it will not bear. And when a land kills of its own volition, we acquiesce and say the victim has no right to live. We are wrong, of course, but the idea pads the fantasy of our strength and disguises the proximity of our own frailty. And I think that that is the final line of the play and it really articulates why we're it using puppets, this idea of fantasy and, and reality kind of coming into a polarity and brushing up against each other in ways that are, some people say shocking, but this is a world that we live in and asking, can we care? Can we care? 
both as actors on stage, can we hold a place for the black body? And, and with the puppets, a flesh-based actor can, can hold and make a safe space. And within this performance, there are moments of silence that we have spent a lot of time saying, can we do this? Can we just make a, a moment and simply hold Pecola and, and say that we can offer her safety? It, these are things that were, are important to us as creators of this work and continue, we continue to try to find out how we can bring that to the narrative. I'm not sure how much time I have, but I will like to show the video. It's about three minutes. Do I have time for that, Paulette? Okay, thank you. This is Mrs. Breedlove when she has gives birth to Pecola. Our original our, and our company still is a multi uh, multiracial company, and um, I. And this is Austin Brown and Anarita Mukarzel with um, Claudia. This is um, a scene where almost the entire cast is engaged in what has become a very tough scene for us to rehearse. It is a scene about humiliation. And in my practice of directing, these are not scenes that we do over and over again. Um, I, maybe once, maybe once a week, these are not things that we take lightly in how they impact both the actor in their bodies, as well as their, their mental archive, their spiritual archive, so that they are not to the best of our ability, that we are not asking them to continue to perform trauma in a rehearsal process. The next, please. Um, and this is another scene with another puppet. Some of our puppets are full body puppets and some of the puppets are only parts of the body because we are coming to this play from the point of memory, the point of archive. And as an individual, if your, your, your flesh is the archive, Sometimes there are details that are missing. So I just wanna credit, strongly credit Jenny Young in um, her very careful exploration and questioning of what remains in the memory. Next slide, please. And this is Jasmine Washington and again, Anarita Mukarzel. And Jasmine Washington was um, one of my students when I started the process I think in her junior year and we were finally able to bring it into the stage in the, her senior year and I actually credit Jasmine um, if it hadn't been for Jasmine and the fact that I had faith in her ability to be a, a, an actress that we would not um, have gone I would not have done it because I had this student who, who needed an exploration to um, allow her gifts as an actor to come to full fruition. So thank you. And next. And this is the articulation of Pecola. I did not have an intention of casting three actors in the role of Pecola. The first actor I cast is um, Tiffany Nuongo, who is in the back. And these other actors, came to me actually. <laughs> I recall them coming to um, my office and uh, putting a fight in for the role, saying that, that they were actually Coca-Cola and that I had, I had overlooked the fact that they are Coca-Cola. So this became, while it is a smaller puppet, um, they be, I asked Jenny while she was still in South Africa where this conversation with using puppets, if it was possible for us to have three actors voicing the puppet. And within the text, the text is divided among these three actors and most often not at the end of a thought, but right in the middle of the thought or at the beginning of the thought because often that's where the impulse to speak or the impulse to move is. 
And in this way, I was able to draw in um, Toni Morrison's use of music as part of the Lewis I storytelling and certainly across the canon of, of her work. And wherever I could thinking about what's happening in jazz where Sophie Church is one of the characters in the Blue Side, but also in jazz. How can we um, bring in other elements of this canon that I'm vested in preserving um, to the stage? Next slide, please. Why is it only black lives and not all lives? That's what I'm saying. Like you're saying because if Savon Clark was Stephen Clark, then you'd be having a very different conversation. Mother, father, Dick and Jane live in the green and white house. See Jane? She has a red dress. Who will play with Jane? There was enough love in our household to give a little to Bacola, who was sorely in need of someone to care. They are very happy. Crazy fools! You messed up my floor. Look at what you did. Mama said you're here because your mama and daddy went at it? And then your daddy burned up your house, and now you're outdoors. Claudia! What? It's true. It's true, isn't it? I ain't outdoors. We just staying away for a minute while Mrs. Brie left some things around the house. I knew this was a falsehood. We had heard people talking. Girl, you heard about the Brie loves? Lord knows if it's not one thing with bad people, it's another. What? You cut yourself. Look, it's on your dress. Um, um, oh, don't cry. <gasps> oh, Lordy! I know what that is! You ministrated! Am I gonna die? No, you're not gonna die. It just means you can have a baby! It's true I can have a baby now? Sure. Sure you can. But how? Um, somebody has to love you. Oh, how you do it? What? How do you get somebody to love you? Please, God. Blue eyes, like Shirley Temple or Barbie. Oh, yes, yes, that's good. It, it happened. happened. And so is the ugly, untidy how of it. It's not my fault. Are my eyes really very nice? Really, truly, bluey nice. Really, truly, bluey nice. The truly most eye. So it's been a long journey and I gotta tell you, we've had some bumps in the road, but um, I also want to say that one of the things that Jenny and I really wanted to model between the two of us, kept collaborators first across oceans and time, um, that it's okay to have bumps in the road and it's, it's okay to be challenged in the moment of creativity and how can we, we model for our students, how can we, um, disagree and still create and be respectful of one another in the process. Thank you. Okay, I'll hand it to you, Paulette. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Yes, I've got these messages. Ah, I am unmuted. Yes. So um, <laughs> at this time, we would like to ask those who are in the Zoom room with us to um, open your cameras so that we can see your lovely faces. And if you have a question, you can use, um, if you go to the reaction button at the bottom of your screen, at the bottom of that panel, you'll see a raise hand. And I like that, uh, I, I thought I raised my hand. Yeah, it's up. I like that Zoom has finally adapted this so you can choose your skin tone. Okay. 
And so um, our tech crew will be looking out for people who have raised their hands. If you are shy and you do not want to speak your question on camera, you can type it into the chat. Those who are watching on HowlRound, there is also a chat box there where you can um, input your questions and they will be fed up the food chain and hopefully get into the discourse. But since the time is short and our moderators, had, our panelists had already raised several interesting questions, I want to um, pose those back to the panelists. So I wanted to start with uh, Tori and Jamika's question about care. If you could re-articulate that, and then we'll have um, Margaret and Ty respond, and then we'll go that way. Thank you. Of course. Jamika, do you want to? Sure, 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 sure. I think um, just to reiterate what we, we were saying, um, what, and also you know follow up what Margaret also offered to the conversation, just the critical, how critical of an aspect, care, centering care, and people over production, people before um, policy, but to really allow people to be in process with all that that means. And, and I think a part of our jobs as creators, as facilitators of, of those rooms is to be on top of the ways that we engage that. So the labor of like care doesn't all, or how they care for themselves as performers doesn't all fall on them, but we also have some handy resources as the artistic leaders in the space to be able to equip and tool people for what we, we've already sort of been, you know, processing these things in conversation before they get into the room. So just being, you know, like sort of creating these pillars of, of care around the process. It's just so incredibly intricate and, 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 and deeply connected to how we finish up um, and, and not just in, in, in terms of what we present, but also I love what you were saying, Mark, Margaret, about that archival memory. And so um, doing, doing the least harm, you know, as we, as we can, but just how centric care is to, to process. And, and not just performance too, I think we also negate to, to take that time for ourselves as creators. So I just wanna like to add that on, but to really be thinking about you know, how the work is impacting us and like how engagement is impacting us. And so figuring out like what our um, closing up shop rituals are, I think at the end of the night is very important. I do this thing where sometimes I just intentionally close my script instead of leaving it open. I feel like if I leave it open, like all of those thought, thoughts <laughs> continue to just like inhabit my, my space and my mind. So I'm, I've become very intentional about closing the book at the end of rehearsal or my, you know, my laptop. You know, that so I just one of those care rituals that we create around the entire process and back to what you were saying, Ty, about that inter and interconnectedness um, of us all. So how even from creative to tech to production, are we really centering people? Mm -hmm. It looks like uh, Margaret is ready to respond to that and then we'll take Ty's response. And um, Jamika and everyone, so and I think you mentioned this, there's so many of the stories that are available for the stage and for adaptation um, around the lives and worlds of people of color are, are filled with trauma. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the last couple of rehearsals, I've been reminding the cast that while the bluest eye is, there's also, um, there's not only generational trauma, there's also generational love. Mm. And if we can sp take as much care in crafting, making space for, uh, making sure that it's clear to the people who are viewing the work, as well as the people who are creating the work, that's a place where they can find some new leads. Okay, great. Ty, would you like to talk about care? It could even be about how you care for yourself. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, centering care is a value. It's, it's an ethic that I work with because I think these are instilled in the values of, of, of culture. And I think, you know, I think keeping at the forefront at every opportunity is who does the work serve, right? Um, that's when you are even gathering, you know, collaborators, you know, I, you know, I'm working with like Kate Freer and also Blair Thomas here on our screen. 
who um, is with the Chicago Puppet International Festival who do not identify as indigenous. And there are folks um, on the team who do identify as indigenous, but you know, it's like, how do you endeavor to expose and dismantle bigotry and biases in different ways? And that to me only comes from the shared leadership because um, toxicity that negatively impacts um, racialized structures in terms of colonialism and capitalism that everyone is prone to, even ourselves as indigenous people are acculturated to colonialism. How at every step of the process, how does this impact the environment, social, economical ecosystems that the production is happening, right? So there, um, and that to me, can only come about from shared leadership and deepening that democracy because um, it's decision-making powers, right? Like what would it be like if there were four directors who are sort of looking at uh, a puppet and how it moves in the space? What would it be to have, you know, um, grandmother, auntie sitting in the corner and valuing this cultural knowledge um, that, that can impact the piece. And to me, when I think about care, I think about how is one indigenizing and decolonizing time, space, and resources at all stages of that, because that kind of accountability is vital to the health mm -hmm. of a piece so it can have uh, sustainability. Okay, thank you. So um, let's go to Margaret for the second question open to the panelists. Do, do you have something you would like to articulate? It's certainly around um, care. I, I think I, I actually think I did that in the in my presentation, mm -hmm. but I will articulate it. Yeah, again. you you did, but we heard a lot of stuff, and so I need a question that everybody can respond to. Thank you. Okay, but um, <laughs> it was uh, it. I'm going to pose, I'm going to answer the question with a question. Because ah. A lot of times you will, ha you at least with me, you can embed the care into the rehearsal process mm -hmm. because you have a long time. But what happens when you come to the mm -hmm. festival and you have 10 days? Yeah. And I, I will say, I'm just going to own it, that I thought that the care that we experienced and made room for in the rehearsal process would necessarily carry over. And there seemed to be a lot of pressure on the cast sort of expecting and needing the same kind of care. So how will I incorporate that into um, future times when the process is much smaller to make sure that at no point, I'm, I have very, I always tell students, I have very little interest in putting on shows Right, so it still feels like yeah. we're a community. We've cared for each other, and and this performance is a result of that. Not we're not just you know putting on. I yeah. don't want to, I don't want to say shows because then people think I don't like it. But <laughs> just put on a show, I jazz hands and smiles. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you. I don't, I don't have the answer for it yet. It's something I need to um, work on. Okay. So Tori, Jamika, or Ty, you have a response or thoughts about that? I can respond. Um, um, although Jamika looks like she's got something what she wants to say too, but I, I mean, I, we don't have an answer either. Um, is is my short answer is that we have tried to move quickly in the past and and have realized that we've had to back pedal, um, particularly in our situation where over a long period of time developing work with a specific group of people that we've spent a ton of care um, and really investigated every scene, every moment, every word, um, the puppeteer's uh, thoughts and responses to everything. And then we have a puppeteer who leaves because they're going off to do amazing things. And we bring in another puppeteer and quickly realize that puppeteer needs all of that background um, and can't be dropped in quickly. Uh, and so we're working on that, um, frankly, and Jamigo can, can share more, but I, I can just say that we've experienced the downside of not, of, of assuming that it carries from one location to another, or assuming that if we're doing the show and rehearsing for six weeks at home and then take it to New York and have a week that it's gonna be okay. And, and we have to be really careful. Yeah. And I think what I'm responding to is actually something that Ty said 
just about how we have to be working to decolonize, you know, out the entire time, because I think what we get so caught up in is all of these white supremacist ideas around like what perfection looks like or what finished look like, looks like. And so I think that work actually begins with the creative, creative leadership around really, uh, you know, decolonizing and rethinking what we think perfection is, right? Like who told us that that's what a good play looks like, right? Who said that, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think, and honestly, I think like really leaning into like African and indigenous and native traditions and rhythms that really allow like deep nurturing and fostering and, cult you know, cultivating. It's like you, you, you plant the thing and then you take care of it for you to get the thing. And so I think that again, just has to, that, that care again also comes in the form of uh, de reconstructing and decolonizing our own sort of ideas around finished and uh, what the, what values we actually, that actually matter when it comes to performance. Like what are we really wanting to, the audience to glean that we're masterful, like when it comes to like the aesthetics of the thing, or that we've really got connection to like what's going on in humanity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Ty, did you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. absolutely. And I, I love what um, you had brought up, Jamika, too, this idea about re regeneration, right? Natural systems that have already existed since time immemorial. This has happened with people who are closest to particular kinds of lands, which become really important, right? That mm -hmm. conversation, this idea about remembering, you know, um, our past, but also that kind of futurism where I think that's where, you know, like native futurism and, and the uh, African futurisms are, you know, siblings in that kind of way. So how is it that every step of the process, one is beginning to create that radical kind of care yeah. when you are saying no to, you know, these tools and models that weren't meant for our cultures, right? Yeah. The way that we're operating, valuing things like um, perfection and, you know, thinking that time is the biggest colonizer, but right, redefining that to think about time as a relative. Time can be a relative. I'm going to like, I'm going to hold time with grace, like we're holding technologies with grace, like these kinds of tools and creating those ethical conversations and values around how one is creating work become really important. And that's why I, I personally really really appreciate. I can't do it alone, right? That also is a tool of white supremacy, right? It's it's like I'm I'm centering the circle. I'm centering community. I'm centering, you know, how amazing to be around minds that are becoming one, right? That's a philosophy of the six nations people. Let our minds become one, right? So that we can do the thing, do the work that we needed to create the tool of, of resistance or the tools of disruption or the tool of interpretation or the tools of joy or liberation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, just like a quick response when, you know, when I think about like peoples of color, like, a, and especially on, from my experience on American lands and as a black, as a descendant of, uh, of slaves, I think it's not radical for me as a black person to imagine rest, actually, because I dream about it all day, every day. And I feel like my mother and her mother and her mother and her mother have like constantly like dreamed about leisure and time, but just have not had access to it. So I think like, you know, the black and browns and, you know, POC minds of this world are already sort of like radicalizing like what that, while, while people are fighting about whether or not there should be these 10 out of 10s, we like, they, they, it shouldn't because we're already like, you know, fantasizing rest, I think on a daily basis. We, you know, 400 years, like the long time. And then we talk about our indigenous brothers and sisters, you know, timeless, you know, working and tilling this land. And so, yeah, <laughs> we can imagine it easily. I think that more, yeah. Okay, great. So Ty, I think you seeded this intervention by asking us to imagine a decolonized future. And I think that the panelists have spoken to that. And now um, we've got the pot bubbling over in live stream. So let's uh, take a question um, from the, uh, our colleagues in the catapult. So who can feed that up? Hi, I'm Jacqueline Wade. Uh, I did get a chance to see uh, Tori and uh, Demilka. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing Demika. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I got a chance to see uh, Dreaming Twice uh, 
was Cheryl Henson. And what was interesting was I loved it. However, my issue, biggest issue was not the performance, not anything you did, but I sat there uh, one evening, I was in the back and the audience member was laughing. Okay, and it, to me, it was like, it was infuriating. Okay, so I know you can't control how people respond to it, but I felt that there needed to be some kind of audience talk back and maybe because it was COVID or not, but I just felt that the piece was so, um, I don't want to say traumatizing, but it just hit me in so many levels. And then to hear that person laugh like that, you know, and I don't know, you know, why they were laughing. Maybe they thought the images were funny or maybe they were just nervous laughter. And to wonder, you know, how they were carrying the information that was disturbing to me. But otherwise, I love the piece, but I just felt that with something as powerful as what you you're giving people, you, you, I felt that you, you can't just give it to them and then they go home and process it. No, you need to process, they need to process it right then and there after the show. That's it. Yep. Yes. Uh, we, uh, the short answer to your question is we were not allowed to do talkbacks because of COVID. Um, and we entered into um, the agreement to do that show with an understanding that a talkback is always a part of our production. Um, and it, And we weren't allowed to do that given COVID uh, at that moment. And, um, and so that's the, that's the short, short answer, but I can, uh, Jamika, do you want to share it? it would, we heard that yeah. laugh. Mm -hmm. Our performers heard that laugh. Um, we, we also, uh, it was, it was something that we really needed to then have a discussion about and talk about because it was, uh, um, it was surprising and upsetting to, to the company as well. I think my 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 response wants to assume no harm and, and want and, and wants to like give space to the fact that that could have been a trauma response, right? Like sometimes our bodies like react to things in ways that don't make sense to other people, but it, because we all sort of hold trauma and harm, you know, in various places, I want to just sort of like give space and grace to say potential it could have potentially been a. We, we just don't have context around, you know, what that laugh is. And then one of the things that I've also, Tori's right, that we have said, you know, talkbacks are um, an essential part of our process. And I think that we've also sort of, in, in line with that, also sort of created this system of how our artists of color don't sort of get overwhelmed by those talkbacks in those moments, right after they come out of performance when people are trying to like unravel and unpack their feelings, how can we also be protective over, you know, the needs? And so Tori is like, y'all just look at me or flag me down. If somebody's kind of got you cornered, you know, I'll, I'll swoop in and, but also like, so, so yes to the talkbacks. And I think also we have, um, we've, we've also wanted to be very careful that even though audience is ready to sort of unpack and unlock things that our performers have just come out of a whole hour embodied experience with these objects and and that deserves a little uh, some sensitivity as well mm -hmm. okay thank you so on my clock it's 11 30. i don't know what how round does or when they cut us off but can we squeeze in one question from HowlRound? I think we... Um, I think we can, uh, Paulette. And first mm -hmm. of all, just on HowlRound, we're hearing so many great reactions to all of the panelists and the work that you've shared today. So thank you so much for that. We can't take all the questions, but here is one from um, Tim. Um, uh, what are some ethically based best, best practices when working with puppets that hold or carry a different racial, ethnic identity, gender expression, or even species designation than you, <laughs> the human actor, what are some ways um, to, uh, to work with that? Uh, I think I'll, I'll start off and if that's okay, Paulette. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I think is actually starts with before you even pick up the puppet um, is to create um, some community agreements for um, the 
the folks that are doing the performance. Um, community agreements can include things like don't assume identity, um, making room for um, apologies and for folks to step back if they've, if they've made a, an error, making space for that. So that's what I'm going to offer, that even before you pick up the puppet, what are they gonna be the agreements for the community of people that are, are creating that work? Mm -hmm. Great, anyone else? I think one thing I wanted to share um, is that we found in our process that finding space, and actually, Margaret, I think um, you mentioned this in, in some of, of your performance, discussing your performance as well, is allowing space for um, the puppeteers to respond to the moment if needed as themselves. Um, and, and that became a, a great tool for us that in particularly with characters that have um, uh, ideologies that are, that are racist or um, in, in, this, in this case are, are one of our puppets, um, giving voice to the puppeteers as themselves so that they don't feel complicit in the moment or complicit with even the character that they are um, performing uh, allowed us a little bit of space in in the context of that moment, particularly with these ideas, although that's separate from the question of identity, but um, allowing that um, individualism to come through in an open way. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add on to what folks say. I really appreciate that. Not knowing the context of this question, all of the social identity locators, who the collaborators are and everything, I think it's like, you know, that moment when like a newborn baby or puppy, you like have it and you have to like do ultimate like extreme radical care. I would say to this individual who asked the question would also go out there on a limb and say, wow, I would just like you need to know the ins, the outs yeah. of this puppet, asking permissions, scaffolding conversations, maybe even before the puppet appears, whatever the puppet might look like. I mean, literally going down to that microscopic level, because we are at a time where there is so much atrocity. We are not even like post racial reckoning. It is happening right now. And this is why I'm so grateful for this conversation. So I would say, yes, should you feel uncomfortable and, and, and sweating and nervous to collaborate on this? Absolutely, 100%. And how can you redefine tension? Because actually tension can be a really dynamic, wonderful thing. Um, and this is also why talking with your collaborators consistently about that, really engaging and you're like, oh, do I have to have this another conversation? Yes, you do. <laughs> and um, because of that, the result will be um, very ex exemplified and, and quite wonderful, I guarantee. And, and al also, saying that you definitely will make mistakes during the way. So 100%. Yeah. Okay. One small thing. Called, okay, Tamika, go ahead. Go ahead. One, one of the things that Tori and I did in the process is just thinking about how symbolism is so important, but, um, you know, post all the things that you all said and we're having those or it's like simultaneous with all of those deep dive conversations. There were some moments where um, we, when we, we'd have a, if there were a, a, maybe a, a non-person of color on a, 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 a puppet of color, we'd have them on the feet and not the hair. And so I think just sort of, you know, thinking about like what the visual imagery of that represents and, and can become reflective of was also something that I really appreciated, I think, in, in the process. So to think about like how the person of color is sort of like holding up the core and then the allyship of having to really move and support with the feet just felt like also some really vibrant um, symbolism uh, to, to, to engage. And, and we found that in performance out, out of necessity, right? Because of, you know, what we had, we, we, we had to shorten down our cast this go around, but just wanted to add like little small things like that and how mm -hmm. impactful they stand to be. Okay, thank you. Um, Blair has given me, he said an extra 10 minutes or so. So I think we can take one final question from HowlRound, so bring it on. Okay, okay, here goes. This is from Luis. In the context of a democracy which is now under attack with the intent of consolidating um, a kind of dictatorship, 
How is your work cultivating a sense of agency and how may it promote participation now and in the future? This is from Louise. Okay. Oh, I, yes. So does anybody want to tackle that head on? I think our work is, is I hope maybe helping to shape a, a sense of agency in, in artists because we are, we've, we've gotten to this point, this place where we are, you know, really uh, intentional about creating space for them to speak up and push back and to challenge. And so I, I really hope that just like the, the action and like opening up to that in a way that we understand is it, it really, you know, that sort of uh, conflict and rigor only stands to sort of propel us forward and, and cause us to sort of branch out and grow a little bit more. We become much more like open to it and in tune with it. And, um, and it's all in service to, to, to the, so even, you know, larger than the creative process, you know, like what the, these pieces like have, um, have stand to, to, uh, to say to the community. And so I think just being able to just like open up the space for transparency, the folks to come in with their access needs. Like I'm a mom. And so just like even some of the times where I'm able to work from Zoom and my kid gets, you know, like for me, I think that's very empowering. I can continue to do this work and like have all of the things that could potentially create barriers. But you know, allowing access to needs and transparency and pushback and room to be challenged in the space, I think, and I hope is sort of moving the dial forward, even if it's just, you know, a tiny bit. Okay. Great. Ooh, I love that. I'll, I'll add on to what Jamika said. I, yes. <laughs> Bring in the real, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, we are in a global COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. What? <laughs> um, do, you, do you remember the time where like not everybody was doing Zoom? What? Right. So I, I'm, I'm saying that because it's really, really important, I think, to create opportunities for new practice, right? New practice um, that is influenced by enriching wisdom, right? So not forgetting about the past, but thinking about all of those things that they can coexist past, present, and future. And to continually to revisit and revise your practice and your structure to protect and honor um, personal and artistic freedoms and access. And this is a value and ethic. And it's also why, you know, I work with um, all my relations collective uh, fellow collaborators that have engaged in these ethical conversations that I think are so, so important. So a little shout out to the collective there. Um, and I'm definitely thinking about also the late Lee Markle, who said uh, freedom is created outside the box created for us, right? So freedom is created outside the box created for us. What? Um, that just, every time I hear that, I just think that, um, you know, a poet, uh, a scholar, uh, a mother, an, an auntie, big auntie vibes, right? Someone that is really was thinking um, ahead of their time and pioneering a new way about to view work. So how does that translate to some of the works that I'm doing? Well, I think, um, you know, in Skeleton Canoe, for example, we are doing an in-progress showing uh, this weekend. We've invited uh, the McCuckers, um, uh, basket makers who never been to the theater, like never been to a puppet show before, but who are in great detail, so skilled at craft where they don't even use thread. They use the roots of trees to thread things together. I mean, we're talking like the most um, amazing individuals that are viewing materials as a relative, right? So mm -hmm. that's just a, an ex a, one small example because I'm examining, you know, sustainable materials, the world and relationship to earth in this, in this particular piece. So that's just um, one example. Um, and then the other thing I will say is accountability. How are you holding yourself accountable continually, right? Is it a, a closed rehearsal space where you're like, nope, no youth, no youth can see this magic that's going to happen here. Like everyone must stay outside until Friday. Or are you in an open rehearsal process where anyone can come in and, you know, come see uh, the work and the hands on the work and, and view it and obviously wearing you know, protective wear masks and all of that, um, doing the COVID tests and things as well. So I feel like there's so much opportunities for this um, that I think we must decentralize self um, and open up into that inclusivity circle. And the, what I'll offer is to, um, it, and everybody in this room is doing this, but it takes a, a level of mindfulness 
is to um, honor the lineage, the broad lineage of where your work is coming from. Because um, a lot of African-American practices exist in mainstream theater, but because the lineage isn't honored, it's yeah. been um, mm -hmm. assigned to another person, which is something that I am personally working to mm -hmm. detangle. And it doesn't mean just African-American, but to really get down into it and be broad in on honoring that lineage. Yeah. That, okay, it. so I think we can close out on honoring lineage. Um, I have to offer an apology here uh, on that specific issue because we have an elder who has been on the HowlRound stream that is uh, Bruce Chisse, the son of Ralph Chisse, who is very interested in this conversation. Um, uh, we talked about access needs and Zoom can be a bit confusing for elders. We should have taken more care to bring him into this process so that he could have posed his questions. So I give that apology. And next year when we organize this, we will um, try to do a better job of including our elders. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. There is one more session in the Ellen Van Volkenberg puppetry series. Um, and it starts just a few minutes from now at noon. Dr. Dacia Posner from Northwestern University will be moderating a discussion between four local graduate students and one recent PhD, Dr. Sky Strauss. So they'll be talking about their cutting edge research on how objects make meaning on stage. Please come out and see the wonderful show, The Bluest Eye and also Skeleton Canoe while you have the opportunity here in Chicago. And we will uh, continue the conversation in as many different forms as we can. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paulette. Thank you. Thank you. So nice meeting you, Margaret and Todd. This was this was great, and Paulette, you as well. Thank y'all. Thank you. Yes, thanks Thank for you, coming. Everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you.